Subacute thyroiditis, otherwise termed as decurvain subacute granulomatous thyroiditis, is thought to be due to post-viral inflammatory process after an upper respiratory infection. Patients present with fever and features of hypothyroidism and a painful or tender goiter. Thyrotoxicosis in subacute thyroiditis results spontaneously within a few weeks and may be followed by a hypothyroid phase lasting a few months. Most patients eventually recover to a euthyroid state. Elevated levels of ESR and CRP along with low radioiodine uptake is also seen in these patients. Treatment is symptomatic with beta blockers to control thyrotoxic symptoms and NSAIDs for pain relief. Glucocorticoids are also used for severe thyroid pain not responding to NSAIDs. Painless thyroiditis is associated with thyroid peroxidase autoantibodies and is considered a variant of chronic autoimmune lymphocytic thyroiditis, the Hashimoto's thyroiditis. It is similar to postpartum thyroiditis, but by definition excludes patients within a year of pregnancy. Patients may have a small non-tender goiter, and it usually follows a self-limited hyperthyroid phase where patients often develop a hypothyroid phase later on, which may persist or may return to a euthyroid state, just like that in subacute decurvanes thyroiditis. Painless thyroiditis does not require specific therapy. However, as hyperthyroidism causes adrenergic overstimulation, a beta blocker may be prescribed to control symptoms, especially palpitations and tremulousness. A high level of TSH along with high levels of free T3 and T4 is seen in secondary hyperthyroidism and should be followed up with an MRI of the pituitary gland. Most TSH secreting pituitary adenomas are macroadenomas and patients with this condition typically have a goiter due to the effect of TSH on the growth of the thyroid follicles. A life-threatening complication of underlying hyperthyroid status is thyroid storm. Thyroid storm can be triggered by any acute stress like surgery, trauma, infection, or childbirth. It can also be seen in patients loaded with iodine while undergoing a CT scan with an iodinated contrast agent. Patients present with features like very high fever, which can be as high as 40 to 41 degrees Celsius, along with tachycardia, hypertension, symptoms of congestive heart failure, and arrhythmias. Neurological symptoms like agitation, delirium, seizures, or coma are not uncommon, and patients can also complain of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Physical signs include the presence of a goiter, lid lag, tremor, jaundice, and warm, moist skin. Treatment is with the administration of, again, beta blocker to control the adrenergic manifestations, followed by propyl thiouracil and iodine loading to decrease the hormone synthesis and its release. Glucocorticoids should be given to decrease the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3, which is the most active form, and also to improve vasomotor stability. Underlying cause needs to be identified and corrected immediately. Approach to thyroid nodule. A thyroid nodule on physical examination requires further evaluation by obtaining a TSH level and an ultrasound of the neck. If patients have risk factors for cancer with a positive family history, exposure to radiation earlier in life, or any evidence of cervical lymphadenopathy, or if the patient is present with compressive symptoms like hoarseness, difficulty in swallowing, and if there are ultrasound findings which are suggestive of cancer, a fine needle aspiration should be performed 
and treatment options should be employed based on the FNA results. If there are no cancer risk factors or if the ultrasound findings are not suspicious of any cancer, the TSH levels should be checked. If the levels are normal or slightly elevated, a fine needle aspiration needs to be performed to the thyroid gland and treatment is based on the findings. On the other hand, if the TSH is low, iodine 1, 2, 3 scintigraphy needs to be followed up with. And if the findings are suggestive of a hyperfunctional or hot nodule, treatment for hyperthyroidism should be employed. If the iodine scintigraphy results are suggestive of a hypofunctional or a cold nodule, an FNA needs to be performed and treatment is based again on the findings of fine needle aspiration. Now, management of hyperthyroidism in general for patients with mild disease and with small goiters and with low TSH receptor antibody titers is with antithyroid drugs alone and they have at least 50% likelihood of permanent remission. Antithyroid drug therapy alone is also used in pregnant women or older patients with limited life expectancy. In patients who have significant symptoms and thyroid hormone levels, which is at least two to three times the normal, an antithyroid drug with a beta blocker is essentially recommended to stabilize the patient before definitive treatment with thyroidectomy or radioactive iodine ablation is undertaken. Pre-treatment with antithyroid drugs is also recommended for patients at increased risk for complications due to transient worsening of hyperthyroidism following radioactive iodine ablation treatment. Methamazole is teratogenic in the first trimester and can cause cholestasis, whereas propylthiouracil can cause hepatic failure and ANCA-associated vasculitis. However, agranulocytosis is the most feared side effect seen in patients treated with antithyroid drugs. It is caused by immune destruction of granulocytes, and most cases occur within the first 90 days of treatment. However, routine monitoring of granulocyte count is not really cost-effective or nor it is advocated, but once the patient complains of fever and sore throat, the antithyroid drug should be discontinued immediately and a white blood cell count measured. If a total WBC count is less than 1000 per millimeter cube, it requires permanent discontinuation of the drug, but if the levels are more than 1500 per millimeter cube, antithyroid drug toxicity is unlikely to be the cause of sore throat and fever and other causes needs to be evaluated. Propylthiouracil is usually not the preferred drug due to the risk of severe liver injury and acute liver failure. However, it is the preferred drug during the first trimester of pregnancy due to fetal teratogenicity with methamazole. Many patients treated with antithyroid drugs for one year or so go into permanent remission. Adverse effects of radioiodine ablation is that the patient will have permanent hypothyroidism with possible worsening of ophthalmopathy and radiation adverse effects. Adverse effects of surgery include a permanent hypothyroidism along with risk of recurrent laryngeal nerve damage and risk of hypoparathyroidism as well. So that concludes our session on hyper thyroidism. Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you in our next video.